Hi, I'm Neil Winger. I'm a professor in the Department of Medicine at UCLA. I'm a primary care doc, and I direct the Ethics Center um, at UCLA. Um, I'm here to talk with you today about decision making uh, for individuals who lose decision making capacity um, in a very important area that primary care doctors like myself are very often involved in and something that a patient who might lose decision making capacity and particularly a family of patients uh, such patients or patients with dementia um, can do a lot about beforehand in order to make sure that patients receive the treatment that they would want. Uh, today, I will spend some time talking about some of the tools available to patients and their families to ensure that that happens. Next slide. So let's take a case. This is a not uncommon case that one of us uh, would see uh, if we were caring for patients in the hospital. Uh, a 75-year-old woman with advanced dementia is admitted to the hospital from home with an aspiration pneumonia. Um, due to worsening function, she can't be cared for at home any longer. The question that arises is whether to place a gastrostomy tube, fondly called a G-tube, um, to feed her. That would be a tube that goes directly through the skin into the stomach so that rather than having to eat in a normal fashion, the food could simply be given to her by pouring it into the tube. We're going to come back to this question later because it's one of the most important issues that individuals who will develop dementia ought to be pondering. Medical decision making in general is based on the principle of autonomy, that patients get to direct the medical care that gets provided to them. At the same time, physicians have a beneficent duty that's a responsibility to the patient to tailor their care to the clinical circumstances that this patient is in and to how the patient would want to receive medical care given those clinical circumstances. Next slide. This means that a conversation must occur that includes what the patient's clinical condition is, including their prognosis, and how the patient perceives their quality of life to be, along with how the patient's values come together with what treatment options are reasonably available to treat this patient. And a good conversation would take all three of those, put them together, and through communication, come up with a care plan. And this is important for all aspects of medical care, but particularly for care toward the end of life. We call conversations such as this that aim at care toward the end of life advanced care planning. No D, advanced care planning. This is a process of discussing prognosis and then planning for future medical care. The goal is to ensure that the care received reflects the patient's values toward the end of life. In many cases, this requires specification of who would speak for you if you can't speak for yourself. And in addition, sometimes specification of what those values are and what your preferences are concerning certain kinds of treatments that would come into play if you couldn't speak for yourself. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about capacity. Decision-making capacity is an important component of how doctors decide what medical care to give to an individual. And this is something that a doctor is evaluating every time a patient or a family and a physician together choose a path of medical care. Decision-making capacity is the clinical condition in which a patient is able to adequately participate in medical decision-making to direct their care. And the requirements are you have to be able to communicate in some way. You have to be able to understand the relevant information about the decision being made. You have to be able to appreciate the situation and its consequences and to rationally manipulate 
the information. So take this case. Next slide. Uh, a man in his late 70s has moderately advanced Alzheimer's disease, and he begins to complain about mouth pain, and he stops eating. An examination reveals that he has an infected molar. His tooth needs to be extracted. At the dentist, he refuses to cooperate with the tooth, extract, with the tooth extraction. Now, most of us immediately recognize that this is a patient who likely is incapable of making the decision whether his tooth should be extracted or not. But this evaluation explicitly of whether a patient has capacity is a very important component of treating individuals who have cognitive impairment. Because some decisions patients will be able to participate in, maybe even fully make. And other decisions they might be able to play a role and in others, the decision will have to be made for them entirely. So a little bit more about decision-making capacity. You can gain it and you can lose it. Those of you who are the family members of uh, an individual with dementia will notice many times that they're much perkier and much more able to participate in decisions earlier in the day or when not distracted than perhaps later in the day when they become more fatigued or tired. Capacity is also decision specific, as I said. You need more, you need to display more capacity for a more difficult decision. Who judges it? Your doctor judges it. And in fact, I would suggest it gets judged at every interaction where an important decision is made. Who will be able to speak to the patient's values? And if we are past the point where the patient can speak, did we miss the opportunity? to ask the questions that the decision makers would want. And if we have missed that opportunity, as very frequently occurs, because it creeps up on us or we don't think about it, or the lack of capacity occurs quickly, how can we best make decisions for this individual? Next slide. Advanced care planning all in practice very frequently means specifying who's going to make decisions for a patient who loses decision-making capacity. We also will frequently delve into what are the valued activities of this person? What health states would they want to avoid? We're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth later, but these questions very frequently will elicit meaningful responses that doctors and families can then follow as patients become more ill. And sometimes we'll even ask about specific treatment preferences, though I, that's last on the list because it's probably least important. Because if we have done a good job of tapping into values and health states that patients wouldn't want to live in, then doctors who know this patient well and work closely with the family can usually explain which treatments this patient would want to avoid in order to live the way that they prefer. One tool that hopefully all of you have seen before, and if not, it's a very important tool to have available, is called an advanced directive. This is one version of the California Healthcare Directive. There are several versions. They are all, if they contain the appropriate components, applicable within the state of California and would likely be recognized throughout all the states. This advanced directive has two main goals to it. First, it serves to specify who would make decisions for the patient if the patient can't make decisions for themselves. This is usually obvious. It's the spouse or the child or perhaps a brother or a sister and there's usually little question in who would be making the decisions for this individual. However, if we don't ask that explicitly, we often will not know that the patient prefers that one individual be the spokesperson or bank the decisions and others not. I have had situations where when I asked a patient who they would want to make decisions for them, it was a friend or a landlord we would never have known to turn to those individuals 
to facilitate decision making. This document allows that to occur in a legal fashion where the physicians will know precisely who to turn to and will look to those individuals. Now, will those individuals know what this patient wants? That's the other value of this document. This document allows for a discussion to occur. Optimally, this conversation would occur with the patient still able to talk about these topics, the family members who need to hear what the patient has to say, including the family member who will be the person's agent when they lose decision-making capacity, facilitated by the physician who follows them in continuity. That is nirvana. That's what we strive for. A half-hour conversation seated perhaps in an exam room around a table where you ask the patient, tell me, you understand that you have a condition where you're going to lose your mental faculties over time. These are the kinds of things that might happen with you. What do you value? What do you want to preserve? What situations do you not want to get yourself into? That will help us guide what treatments you should be receiving. And a full and open conversation of that sort can make decision making down the road far, far easier on everyone, including the patients whose values get respected and the family who know they're making the decisions that this patient would want. Now, if you're saying, wow, I wish we had had that conversation, but that needed to occur two or three years ago, we still can best reflect patients' decision making, and we'll talk about that shortly. There are documents that can help us work through values to help us think deeply about what really matters to us. Five Wishes is one of those documents. Uh, this is a uh, document that you have to pay for. You can buy it off the web. It's a rather nominal price. I think it's $1.50 or $2 to get one. And it's, a, it's like a workbook that asks, what are the things, what are the functions that most matter to you? What would you be willing to give up to preserve other functions if that were feasible? What are conditions that you simply would not want to live in? Would you be willing to receive life-sustaining treatment if, in fact, you couldn't recognize your loved ones? Would you be willing to receive life-sustaining treatment if you couldn't care for yourself in basic functions such as feeding or toileting or dressing? These are conversations that can easily be had in a doctor's office or even among family members outside of the clinical setting, although one would hope that that information then gets into the clinical setting. And if, in fact, one wants to have an in-depth conversation, this is an excellent tool to be able to achieve that. Next slide. So take this case. A 78-year-old man with moderate cognitive impairment and heart failure gets hospitalized for shortness of breath. During the hospitalization, the physician discusses prognosis with the patient's son, who is the patient's decision maker. And together, the son and the physician decide that it would be best for the patient not to be re-hospitalized if possible, and not to receive resuscitation, not to perform CPR, or receive the burdens of ICU care. He'll go to a skilled nursing facility for rehab and then hopefully be able to return home. This patient, unfortunately, couldn't participate in this conversation because his cognitive impairment was too advanced. What would be the right planning document for this patient where decisions have been made about the types of care that should be provided for him? Next slide. This is the right document. It's called Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or POLST for short. It's pink in color. It actually is sort of a cardboard kind of consistency. But a copy of it, plain white paper, is perfectly acceptable and also holds sway. This is very different than an advanced directive, and they can go hand in hand. This document doesn't specify who the surrogate is for the patient though you can write that in on the document. What it does is indicate what sort of medical treatments should be provided to this patient. In this case, the son and the doctor together chose 
not to um, resuscitate the patient should he suffer a cardiopulmonary arrest. That gets checked here, do not attempt resuscitation on the document. That physician order then can follow the patient into the skilled facility and the document then can go home with the patient. That preference can be respected in all venues of medical care. If in fact a cardiopulmonary arrest occurs perhaps years later at the patient's home, if the pulse is available there, the emergency services providers, those on the ambulance, will respect it as a physician's order. This is a very valuable tool where decisions have been made concerning resuscitation, tube feeding, and overall plan of care. What kinds of decisions frequently need to be made for patients as they near the end of life? Now, as I mentioned before, we try to focus less on particular treatments and more on patients' values. I'm going to talk more about that shortly. But the kinds of things that frequently need to be decided in order to make sure that patients receive the medical care that they would want are resuscitation. Would you receive cardiopulmonary resuscitation, including CPR that we've all seen on TV with pushing on the chest to move the blood through the heart, and then electrical shock? Would you be on a ventilator, a machine to breathe for you, dialysis if your kidneys have failed? Would you want ICU treatment at all with all the burdens involved in it? Would you want to be hospitalized? Many people make a choice that they would prefer not to be in that hospital where they put IVs in your arms and they keep on waking you up to check your blood pressure. And tube feeding is a particularly important topic for people that um, will become cognitively impaired. We're going to go into that in depth momentarily. Our goal is to have patients make decisions that medical care then follows, for them to speak for themselves. That's the goal. Very frequently, in fact almost always, there are decisions to be made that patients can't talk to us about either because they have become too cognitively impaired or because currently they're too sick and they can't tell us whether they would want treatment X or Y. Under those circumstances, we hopefully know what the patient would want because we spoke to them before. A patient's prior statement of preference is, is um, thought of as very close to the patient talking to us right now, which is why these conversations are so important to carry out. If we haven't had those conversations, second best is what we call the substituted judgment. A substituted judgment is not someone else deciding for the patient. It is someone who cares a lot about this patient, usually a family member, often a spouse or a child, who says, I know this patient's behaviors and thoughts and values. And while we never discuss this exact topic, I can reflect on those values and know that dad would want this treatment. Or dad would say, no, that wouldn't be for me. It's a choice based on the behavior and history of a patient and what's known about their values. We respect that as next best to knowing exactly what the patient would have wanted. Now, unfortunately, we're often relegated to the third best mechanism, and that's a best interest judgment. A best interest judgment is where the individual looks at the condition of the patient and the choices that the doctors say the patient has and then says, well, I th I'm guessing, or if it were me, this is the choice that I would make. You can see why that isn't nearly as good as a substituted judgment or the patient's own words. Yet, it's much better than not having a decision maker at all, which raises an important point that I forgot to mention earlier about the advanced directives. The advanced directive also allows an individual where there isn't an obvious decision maker to specify who that person would be. Because as you can tell, if we don't have a decision maker at all, 
It's the worst of all possible circumstances. You end up usually with an individual appointed for you who doesn't know you and probably doesn't love you, or a group of individuals making a decision together. That's least best. This point is rather subtle, but deserves at least to be said out loud. That surrogates have to have decision-making capacity too. They need to be able to understand the information and weigh it and make a decision that's in the patient's best interest and hopefully based on what they know about that patient. When one chooses a decision maker, you want someone who has capacity or is not about to lose it. Next slide. So, how do we pull this all together? We pull this together by making sure that there's a conversation. And that conversation focuses on what a patient would want. And if I were talking to a patient who in the future will lose decision-making capacity. And this conversation can occur with the family after that has already occurred. But of course, it's best to do prospectively. I might say to the patient, this is what happens to patients who have dementia, who become more ill. They end up losing valuable functions, such as being able to walk as well as they did, to be able to dress and carry out their usual functions, and at some point, actually, to be able to eat normally, too. Food doesn't go down the way that it's supposed to go down. And what will happen over time, and this is a conversation that isn't easy, necessarily, to have, and you can see at that point, I may need to stop and say, maybe we should continue this next visit. Or maybe we should let you think about this or let you ask questions before I proceed. But if I can proceed, I can move on and ask about how would you feel if you were being lovingly cared for at home but couldn't carry out your activities of daily living, such as getting dressed and being able to feed yourself? Is that acceptable to you? What if you became sicker? and couldn't meaningfully interact with the loved ones around you. Would that be acceptable to you? And what if you couldn't eat for yourself? The food wouldn't go down. You continually got pneumonia. What we do under those circumstances is put in a tube to feed you. Actually, we don't do that, but it's a medical treatment that's available. What would you want? This conversation can then lead to a series of understandings of what this patient would want so that the physician can then recommend to the family based on what we know of this patient's values the patient would likely not want to have a tube put in to feed them at this point they didn't want to get to that point or their their condition has advanced so far that they now are debilitated to the point that they wouldn't want life-sustaining treatment we shouldn't be putting them into the ICU. We shouldn't be hospitalizing them. So that way, understanding the values and the health states that people wouldn't want to live in, it's very easy, actually, to be able to predict what sorts of treatments people would or would not want. That's advanced care planning. That's the conversation that we're shooting for. Next slide. Now I want to spend a couple minutes talking about artificial feeding because it's so applicable to patients who will lose decision-making capacity. And this is one of the most heart-wrenching decisions that families often need to make. What's the value of putting a tube into an individual to help feed them? We're going to talk about does it prevent aspiration pneumonia? That's pneumonia where the food goes down the wrong pipe. Does it prevent malnutrition and its consequences? Does it improve survival? Does it improve functional status? And what's the evidence base? At the, at the front end of this, I will tell you, we don't have clinical trial data to be able to tell you whether putting in a tube succeeds in doing any of these things. But we have very good observational data. Those are um, information from watching patients with dementia who have tubes put in, what happens to them. And I can now present that to you. Next slide. Uh, a study by, by Tom Finnegan, 
um, which is now more than 10 years old, actually, more than 20 years old, summarized 15 observational studies of people with advancing neurologic disease, mostly dementia. And what they found is putting in a feeding tube appeared not to change the length of survival. Now, this is in, a, in circumstances where the patient continues to be fed. That means it takes a lot of time to sit and help to feed an individual who may not be swallowing well. If, in fact, we didn't feed the individual very well, perhaps there would be a survival differential. But under best possible circumstances, putting in that tube really only served to isolate this individual because one of the few things that they did meaningfully to interact with others was being fed. And now that turned into simply pouring a can into a plastic tube. Next slide. The whole question about malnutrition being, um, malnutrition complications being uh, fixed by putting in a tube seems to suggest that the things that we're hoping for by improving nutrition through a tube don't work. I have had many uh, families tell me, gee, you know, just a few weeks ago, mom would sit with us at the table and we, we could help feed her. And now she's too weak to do that. And we think if we could just get more calories into her, she'd be less malnourished, she'd be able to sit with us at the table before, as, the, as she did before. The studies seem to suggest that that is not the case, that it's the disease proceeding, not really the malnourishment that is the cause of mom's decline. Now, there are some studies, perhaps, that suggest improvement in treatment of pressure ulcers. This is something that would have, have to be discussed with your physician. Next slide. What we do know is that the vast majority of people who have gotten to the point where they need a feeding tube put in are very close to death. And we are not changing that by putting in the feeding tube. Studies show that within a month, one-fifth die, and 40% or more die over a year. Next slide. The question of treating complications of dementia also suggests that feeding tubes don't improve functional status for individuals. Next slide. Does it reduce suffering? This is a really important area because there is the concept that putting in a feeding tube will make mom not be hungry or not be thirsty. There really is no evidence to back that up. The fact is that there are considerable complication rates to putting in tubes like this. And those who don't express hunger or thirst, in fact, probably have more discomfort when they're being fed through a tube, certainly not less than if they were allowed to eat or drink the small amounts that they would naturally simply by being fed with a spoon or a fork. But we all get caught up in this question. Is food a medical intervention? Or is it love? Is it what we do? Is it OK to ever step back, to ever step back and recognize that at the end stage of dementia, people stop being hungry and stop being thirsty and stop eating? That it's a natural part of the disease. So this led Howard Brody, one of the preeminent ethicists in the United States today, more than a decade ago, to say that far from relieving suffering, artificial feeding might be a form of torture. Now that's a rather bold and strong statement. But in fact, many of us have seen artificial feeding to not apparently serve a patient. And in fact, it appears to be serving the nursing home that the patient is in, because it's easy to pour a can into a rubber tube, and sometimes a family. Next slide. 
So in advanced care planning, one of the critical aspects is to take on tube feeding because this is something that we can know will become a question as people become more cognitively impaired. So a study was done looking at when feeding tubes were put into patients with dementia. They looked at 154 patients and the charts, the medical charts reflecting the placement of the feeding tube. One appeared to have an adequate conversation documented in the medical record. And for the 33 patients who were thought to be able to participate in the decision making, they participated less than a th uh, about a third of the time. The fact is that these are very, very important conversations. We ought to have them when people can participate, and we ought to think about them in detail when people can't. Next slide. Ethically, we can both withhold and withdraw food and fluids. Next slide. Just a couple more points and then we'll wrap up. Uh, these are recent data uh, from an article published just a couple months ago by Joan Tino and her colleagues that are showing that across the United States we are improving somewhat in recognizing what treatment is like is, will benefit patients toward the end of life. Between the year 2000 and the year 2009, we increased the percentage of patients who were receiving hospice at the time of death from 22% up to 42%. And the percentage of patients, um, uh, however, the percentage of patients with short stays in hospice increased simultaneously. But the point I want to make is that prior to that decision, we are treating patients increasingly intensively. So the basic pattern is that patients receive hospitalization and intensive care leading up very close to death. And then suddenly we pull on the brakes. This is not what would be expected if there were good advanced care planning. And it shows that we as a nation can do better in this area. Next slide. And when we look specifically at how patients in the hospital toward the end of life get treated, these are data that looked at an entire year of hospitalization among patients who died and specific things that we should be doing well for patients who are very close to death, such as turning off an implanted defibrillator whose job it is to restart the heart when it goes into a bad rhythm. But we only did that less than a quarter of the time. That patients get to participate in life-sustaining treatment decisions when they still are capable of doing it, that happened 40% of the time. And that goals of care got elicited in a timely fashion for patients in the ICU and on ventilators, that happened less than 50% of the time. So it shows that there is a need out there to improve the way that we do advanced care planning, both inside the hospital and outside. Next slide. And what happens when we don't plan well is that medical care is primed to always do more. We have big hospitals filled with machines that can rescue patients amazingly. But what that also can do is if a patient can't be rescued is that we don't discuss prognosis and we don't think about decline. And then the patient gets sicker, but we still don't talk about the fact that the prognosis has worsened until they're in the intensive care unit. And then we have organ failure and patients are on machines. And what happens is an undignified death with patients suffering more than they should and not dying in the venue that they would prefer not at home with loved ones with excellent hospice care, or perhaps in another venue that they would prefer. But far, new, far too many people die in hospitals in the United States today where that could have been predicted. Last slide. Oh, two more slides. So let's come to the first case that we talked about. We interviewed patients about whether they would be willing to be tube fed if 
they would need to be tube fed permanently. Now these data are patients who aren't necessarily going to be cognitively impaired. And in fact, in my experience, I have never had a patient who told me, when I get to the point where my dementia is so bad that I can't swallow any longer and I'm not going to get better, I want to be fed through a tube. And in fact, in all comers in the hospital, when asked, 52% said that they would rather die and 24% said that they would be very unwilling to be fed through a tube, even if it were offered. Last slide. So when we rethink treatment for our 75-year-old woman with dementia, who now has progressed to the point of not being able to swallow for herself, it is okay to consider the goals of care and to not place a feeding tube into her. It would never be okay to stop offering her food and feeding her to the degree that she wants to be fed and wants to drink and to continue to interact with her lovingly even though she is taking in less food and fluid. We might want to initiate a trial of treatment. I talked to you about the data that suggests that these trials don't have people regain their functional status, but sometimes it's too hard for families not to try. And when indeed we will do a trial, I'll have the families tell me what are the outcomes that they're hoping for. We think that mom will begin to sit up and talk with us again the way that she did just a couple months ago. We think mom will again help get, help get herself dressed. And so we'll say, let's take eight weeks of tube feeding and see whether you're starting to be able to reach the goals you're hoping that mom will achieve. And not infrequently, at two weeks, I'll get a phone call. And the family will say, you know, we said we we're going to give ourselves eight weeks for mom to start helping to get dressed again, but she's only worse than she was before. This tube feeding isn't helping her. Do we have to wait eight weeks? Can we stop it now? And the answer is yes, because this is a medical intervention. And if it's not achieving a goal for the patient, we shouldn't be using it. But most importantly, when we get to a point where we don't know what to do about tube feeding or about any treatment for someone who has advanced dementia, it indicates that we didn't carry out advanced care planning prospectively. Now for many of us, that isn't an option at this point. We can't talk to the patient any longer. But we still can sit down and prospectively have conversations with this patient's continuity physician to be able to map out the kind of care that this patient would want. So this concludes the slide presentation. Now uh, you can ask questions on Twitter using the hashtag pound UCLA MD chat and we'll try to answer them. And we have them on the iPad because everything here is electronic. Um, so the first question is, is the advanced directive a part of a will or trust you might have set up, or is it a document that stands alone? The advanced directive is a standalone document. However, it very frequently is part of the set of documents that an individual would set up with either their lawyer or another individual who's helping them set up uh, a will and a trust. And uh, uh, more and more, those individuals who set up trusts and wills um, have become familiar with these documents. However, you should recognize that an advanced directive is available to you on the web. If you type into Google California Healthcare Directive, you'll have more than one choice. And there's one directly off the california.gov web website. You print it out, you follow the directions, and it's free to complete. So you shouldn't have to pay someone to help you complete an advanced directive, but it certainly can be part of a packet of materials um, that you prepare in advance. Second question, uh, should you have more than one person who can speak for you if you're unable to? What if the person is unavailable? That's actually a great question. Um, it sometimes is wise to specify a second or even a third uh, agent. Um, that also allows the person who specified number one to have it documented that the individual wanted them to be the principal decision maker um, 
and that sometimes can improve relationships, especially between siblings. Um, why was the daughter listed first? For some reason, the daughter always is listed first. Um, and you even can specify who you would not want to make decisions. But in today's uh, world of cell phones, uh, it's, it's so simple to put down the person's cell phone number that we can almost always contact an individual as long as they're still alive and they still have that cell phone number. Um, I want to make sure I'm resuscitated only if I can recover with a reasonable quality of life. How do I communicate that? Well, that's a great question. And actually, you communicate it exactly the way you just did by stating those words. But if I were the one talking with you, I would say to you, what's a reasonable quality of life? I want you to tell me more. What is it that you want to preserve? Would you be happy if you could play cards with friends and live in a skilled facility and watch movies on your iPad, um, but not be able to go out and do the other things you used to be able to do? Would you be happy if you needed help to complete your activities of daily living? Um, these are questions that you can answer. And I then, as the physician, can say, I understand what they're aiming at. They're not going to be able to get to that point. Therefore, we shouldn't resuscitate them. Or there is a reasonable chance that we're going to get them to that point. We ought to resuscitate them. Or I don't know. I'm going to get a colleague to, hunk, to come look at this patient with me so that we can make a reasoned decision. So your statement is a really useful statement, but there ought to be further conversation about it. And then we want it to be documented, hopefully in your advanced directive, or you simply write it on something and attach it to your advanced directive. You then take it and give it to your agent, the person who would make decisions for you, and to your continuity physician, who more than likely these days will be part of a system, and that system will have an electronic medical record, and then electronic medical record, such as UCLA has, will be available to every clinician within the system. So I would take your advanced directive and it would get scanned into the record and anyone who wants to know what your preferences are would click on advanced directives and it would pop right up. What you would want would be there in black and white. Uh, next question. Although I designate a person to speak for me, I still want the decisions made to include my doc and my family. How do I say it? You say it just like you said it. Um, you can even indicate that you want decisions to be made by a group of individuals, but you still should specify one individual to be your spokesperson because decision making made by groups can be unwieldy and sometimes might not best reflect in a timely fashion the kinds of things that you would want done. You say it exactly this way and in my experience it would be respected. Um, in addition to resuscitation, what about fluids, medications, and IV food? Should that be part of the advanced directive? Uh, it very well should be for someone who um, wants to make sure that their preferences concerning tube feeding get carried out in the future. And in fact, you can complete a post form because the bottom of the post form, in California at least, um, explicitly talks about food and fluids and you can make it very clear that you would not want to be permanently tube fed if you weren't going to regain the ability to eat for yourself. Um, is a patient required to create uh, an end-of-life care plan? Uh, the answer to that is absolutely no. Uh, there is no requirement that you do it. However, if you want your values and your preferences to guide the care that you receive toward the end of life, it is really the only way to make sure that that happens. Um, so is it advisable? Strongly. Uh, can I change uh, what I say on the form at any time? Um, the answer is yes, up until the point that you lose decision-making capacity. And at that point, we rely strongly upon what you have written. Um, uh, if you uh, have completed an advanced directive, um, you can uh, 
um, write a new one and void the old one. That's true for a post form as well. Let's say that you and your doctor together uh, made decisions that you would want to be resuscitated and you would want fully aggressive care. Um, and you put that down onto a post form. Um, years go by and you decide that your quality of life isn't what you would want it to be and that if you required resuscitation, um, you, would be un you would find that quality of life to be unacceptable. Uh, you would uh, fill out a new post form with your physician. You sign it, your doctor signs it, the old one gets void written across it, and if you were at UCLA, we would scan both into the system so it's clear that one overrides the other. Um, what is the benefit and expected outcome of advanced care planning? Um, that's a good question. So the expected outcome is that we should be able to provide treatments that are in concert with your goals most of the time. Uh, we may still have some questions, but we can almost always approximate the treatments that we're providing to match the goals that a patient has if, in fact, uh, this advanced care planning um, has, has occurred. Um, the expected outcome would be that you would get the outcomes that you want. Uh, when I go to skilled facilities, uh, I very frequently see patients who have no cognitive interaction at all and are being kept alive through tube feeding. And every time I look at one of these patients, I think to myself, if this person could stand above herself and look down, would she say, oh good, that's the outcome I was hoping for? Um, I very strongly suspect the answer is no in most of those circumstances. Um, what you can do by doing advanced care planning is to ensure that that won't happen to you. Uh, next question. Um, what is meant by artificial feeding? That's, a, that's actually a great question. Um, artificial feeding or artificial nutrition is a food that is given to an individual that they would not be able to take in by themselves using a medical means. That means can be as simple as a silastic tube that's put down a nose or directly through the skin into a stomach. Uh, we have artificial feeding through the vein where fluids flow in with nutrition. Um, anything that is a medical treatment to provide food and fluids uh, is considered artificial nutrition and hydration. And we call that ANH, artificial nutrition and hydration. It is both legal and ethical to use artificial nutrition and hydration as a medical modality. Just as you don't need to, to receive a medication if it won't meet your needs, you don't need to be on a machine if it won't meet your needs, you don't need to receive artificial nutrition and hydration if it's not going to be achieving a goal that you would have wanted. Um, if my mom becomes very sick while she is at a nursing facility, do I keep her there or go to the hospital? If I keep her at the facility, will they be able to follow her end-of-life care plan? Well, that's another good question, and it's entirely based on what her end-of-life care plan is. Let's say that mom says, I would want um, fully aggressive treatment until I can't recognize my loved ones and mom now has an infection that has gone so far that they can't treat it in the nursing home. In that case, in order to see whether you can effectively treat that infection, you ought to move mom back to the hospital to receive whatever the treatments are the hospital can do that the nursing home couldn't. However, if in fact mom is in a health state that she doesn't want burdensome treatment to preserve, or she wouldn't want burdensome treatment at all, then you should be able, within that skilled facility, to provide all the treatments that mom needs, and you shouldn't have to move her back to a hospital, which is really quite difficult for a cognitively impaired individual. The movement itself is hard. They become uh, unaccustomed to their surroundings, which predisposes them to becoming delirious, 
Um, we have all seen individuals in the hospital who don't understand what's happening with them. It's not only scary, but it, it can be painful. Most nursing facilities should be able to provide all the treatments that mom wants if the goal is not a higher, or higher is the wrong word, if the goal is not more intensive and aggressive medical treatment. Uh, and if the place where your mom is can't do that, then you ought to be talking to your doctor about having her move to a different place. I think that we are out of questions now. Uh, thank you for your attention.